Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Meraki Unbox podcast. I am so excited for today's episode, and I know I always say that, but I really, really, really mean it with this one. Um, but before we get into the content, just want to quickly say a plug. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe. Tell all your friends to listen to this amazing podcast. We have new content that comes out about every two weeks, so we want to make sure that all of our listeners are up to date on the latest and the greatest. And if you have any suggestions or wanna get on the podcast or have comments, feedback for us, at Meraki Simon, go ahead and tweet us and we will make sure to collaborate if it makes sense. So that's my shameless plug and now let's get into it. Our guest today is Christy Cook Olchese and she has been with Cisco Meraki for almost eight years now. She started as a product sales specialist in Texas for public sector, uh, working her way up eventually as the field leader uh, for the West in U.S. public sector. And most recently, she took over the director role uh, of Americas for the partner organization. Christy resides in Texas with her husband, Philip, and adorable baby boy, Mateo. Welcome to the Meraki Unbox podcast, Christy. How are you? Hey, Sammy, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. How are you? Yay, I'm so good. I just finished my uh, coffee and I am feeling super energized and excited good. about this conversation. Love that. <laughs> I know. Let's go ahead and start from the beginning. I mean, this is a good jumping off point. Um, I want to hear about your story and I'm sure our listeners too. So how did you get into technology and from that transition, how did you transition from a sales leader to a channel leader? Tell us about that. Oh my gosh, we don't have enough time, but um, how did I get into technology? So I started off as a public relations major in college. Uh, my first job out of college was working at a PR firm. I quickly developed a twitch in my eye trying to sit at my desk for eight hours straight a day and realized that pitching my media to to radio stations and TV networks was not going to be my life's calling. So um, I got tricked into sales when I got hired uh, as a as a business development rep for a janitorial company, of all things, and did that for like four years, loved selling because just by virtue of what I was doing, I started selling and uh, decided that after about four years, I wanted to get into something that I knew was going to be stable. I knew tech or medical were going to be the areas I wanted to explore. Long story short, I had spent a little bit of time on the CBS television show, The Amazing Race, and I put it on my resume. And I sent my resume out to everyone that would look at it. And a Cisco partner saw my resume. He saw The Amazing Race on the resume and decided he wanted to get to know a girl that was crazy enough to do something like that. So they wanted somebody that could sell and they hired me. They taught me the technology and thus began my career in technology. Oh my gosh, what a story. And that is right. I love that fun fact about you, that you were on <laughs> The Amazing Race. For those listeners out there who are huge fans of the show or want to watch it, what season were you on? It was season 13, which makes me absolutely ancient because I think <laughs> that there are like 20, 27 or 30 seasons of The Amazing Race now. It's crazy how long it's been on air. Oh my gosh. Well, it is like the best show ever. So I love that you were on that. And that is absolutely your claim to fame. Okay. So <laughs> the amazing race kind of put you on the map or it was something that flagged or made you stand out on the resume. So you got into Cisco that way, ironically. Tell me about your time in sales as a PSS and a field leader and why you made the jump to the channel organization. What was that process like? Yeah, absolutely. So I spent my first couple of years at Meraki as a product sales specialist. Um, so I sold all, sold all things Meraki into the public sector space, loved it, had a great time doing it, was fortunate enough to win a trip to Meraki Club and um, developed some really great relationships. I'm a firm believer in continual growth and development. And uh, it just kind of started getting under my skin that I, I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to change. I didn't want to leave Meraki, but I wanted to impact people in a more direct manner. And that, that for me was leadership. So I was fortunate enough to get a promotion to lead the SLED West sales organization, which I did for about five years, loved it, had a really tremendous team that was able to accomplish amazing things. And then got to that place again, where I, I kind of felt the itch. Like, 
I love my job. I love my company. I don't want to leave, but I think it's time to try something new. Meraki is amazing because it affords us the opportunity to try new things and to develop new skills. And so the position became open for um, the director of the America's Partner Organization. And having started my career in technology as a Cisco partner and then carried a bag as a seller and then led individual contributors, it was really attractive to me to go back over to the partner side and really dig my, sink my teeth into you know, the organization that helps our company scale so far beyond where we're able to as a sales organization. Our channel partners are really what it allows us to scale so broadly, so widely, and touch so many more customers. It, it's been an amazing transition. It's been about six months. I've learned a ton about the partner organization and how impactful it is to our business. And it's been an amazing opportunity to lead leaders for the first time as well, which is a completely different experience. Um, my leadership team is rock solid. Shout out to all of my leaders. They're just amazing. And it makes my job really fun. Mm, that's, that's awesome. And yeah, there's really something to be said, I think about taking that next step in your career and leading leaders. And I want to come back to that, but if we could rewind for a second, those listeners out there who maybe aren't at Cisco, maybe aren't at Meraki who listen to the podcast and they're sitting there scratching their head, like what the heck is the channel? Um, can you spell that out for us? So like, what is the channel organization? How does it work? And yeah. what's the difference between that and direct selling? And, and how does that impact Cisco's selling motion? Jerry Elliott, who leads the sales organization for Cisco overall, has said that the partner organization or the channel is the crown jewel of Cisco. I love that because I love jewels and all things sparkly and shiny. Um, and really, it, it puts a bow around what the channel is for Cisco, for Meraki. So for those who aren't so familiar with our go-to-market motion, Cisco does not sell their products direct. We sell our products through value-added resellers, which is our, our go-to-market channel. So our partners are out there every single day, driving in their cars across town like I used to do, knocking on doors, getting to know folks, learning about their infrastructure, digging into what their technology projects and their needs are, and then they're pitching solutions to our customers on behalf of manufacturers. You know, we do a ton as a sales organization, but we can only do so much. For instance, you know, when I led the the Sled West sales organization, I had people on my team that that literally covered six states. Now, within those six states, there are hundreds of thousands of Cisco partners who are out there developing relationships and evangelizing our solutions for us. So it's super important that we enable our partners to be successful, to be an extension of our sales organization to sell for us. They are truly what is going to take us to this next phase of growth. And we can't do it without them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. That is the truth. We cannot do it alone. Our goals are getting too big and our partners are our feet on the street, right? And now mm -hmm. they're helping us do the work. So thank you for breaking that down. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about you and what you've done. And clearly you have an incredible track record at Cisco and at Meraki and what you've done with your career. And when I think of you as a leader, something that comes to mind, and I want to call this out is I think you're masterful at, uh, creating your brand, making sure people know who you are and being visible within the organization. And that's a skill set, right? You don't wake up and, and have what you have and have what you've created. So I want to ask you, you know, this is something that, again, when I think of you, that comes to mind right away. How did you develop this skill set? And maybe what are tips that you can give folks listening who don't have a strong sense of personal brand or they're trying to figure out, you know, how do I promote myself within my organization so I can grow my career like that? Well, first of all, thank you for the compliment. I really appreciate that. Secondly, it's funny because I've been asked this question several times and, and I would not have known that it is a skill if you hadn't said so, because to me, I'm just being me. But, you know, if I think about it and I peel back the layers and break it down, there is an art to building your brand. Um, and it's something that you have to work on. I think there's a lot that goes into it. First and foremost, mastering the craft that you're paid to do, right? Like doing your day job exceptionally well is, 
I think the foundation of, of the building blocks of building your brand. So that's table stakes, right? Like always number one, crush the job that you've been paid to do. Number two is make sure everybody knows the great things that you're doing because, you know, people may see, yeah, she's successful. She's doing a great job. But if you don't be your own advocate, if you don't toot your own horn in a humble brag way, <laughs> uh, people, people don't know the details of, of what all you're doing to accomplish great things. Um, and also I just want to call out that again, I don't think there's an art to it so much as it is like having a genuine interest in people learning about them and then in a reciprocal manner, telling them about you and, and what makes you interesting and unique and, um, and what, you know, you do to bring value to the organization. I, I don't think it has to be this calculated brand building exercise so much as it is, you know, having a genuine interest in others, getting to know them and then allowing them the opportunity to get to know what makes you special as well. Mm, yeah, I really like that. Um, and I think it speaks a lot to authenticity, right? Showing up to, to your point, being good at your job is absolutely table stakes, but then showing a genuine interest in, you know, other people and, and making sure that, you know, people around, you know, the work that you're doing and you're interested in the work that your people are doing. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that plays to your brand. I mean, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I'm sure you've gotten this question before, you know, do you, do people ever say to you like, wow, you, you show up and you're super authentic, right? You're true to yourself, or maybe you don't sound like other, you know, leaders in our organization. How do you kind of go about making sure that, you know, you remain professional and all that stuff, but you can still show up at work and be who you are? Yeah, that's a great question. And what I think is so important for us to focus on, because at the end of the day, like we're just lucky that we work for an amazing company that produces life changing technology, truly. But at the heart of it, it's the people that make all of this work and work well. And if we're not showing up as our true authentic selves every day, then we're doing ourselves, our coworkers, our customers, our partners a disservice because we're all we're all too busy to not be authentic and not to enjoy what we're doing and enjoy each other. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I think something that makes me different from a lot of the the other folks that I've interacted with is that I I'm me, Sammy. You know this. <laughs> you know, I you do. Sammy? Monday morning at 8 a.m. I'm the same me as I am Saturday night at 10 p.m., although I'm probably in PJs Saturday night at 10 p.m. these days because I have a toddler. Uh, but I, I think authenticity is so important. And, you know, we do really serious stuff. We produce this amazing technology that literally helps our countries run. It helps our schools provide education to the future leaders of society, but also you know, it's, it's not life and death. And, and what we're doing is, is we're one piece of a puzzle. And if we just bring our whole selves, if we remain lighthearted, if we think about this, every interaction is, is a chance to impact someone in one way or another. And I really try to think about how am I showing up to impact this person? Am I being my, my true self? Am I, Am I bringing positivity and light to this person, even though it may be a difficult conversation? What can I do to posi positively impact the person and the situation um, for the better? I think it's it's really important, and it's and it just makes it more fun if we all show up, and and we're all who we are. So yeah, you know, um, I, I have a new boss. I'll shout out to Hope. Hi, Hope. And one of her first comments to me after you know seeing a couple of the emails that I send to my organization was. Wow, I, I like your communica your communication style. It's it's you know really, it's to the point. It's conversational, and I, I kind of chuckled because um, yeah, I mean I keep it professional. I definitely expect greatness out of my team. They know that and they deliver on it. But also, I keep things personal. I want to know my team as individuals. I want them to know me as an individual so that we can really trust each other, dig in deep, and accomplish great things together. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know what, when you were talking, Christy, what it was making me think of, you know, showing up authentically that Maya Angelou quote, right? People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you make them feel. Yeah. And 
to your point of like, what can I bring to this interaction? Even if it's a tough conversation, how do I show up in a positive light and make people feel seen? I mean, that was my big takeaway from what you just said. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. And that's a great quote, by the way. I know. I love her. Right. <laughs> Well, l- talking about amazing women, let's transition and talk about the work that you did as part of Meraki's ERO. So I think something that that makes Cisco and Meraki stand out truly is our vast community of employee resource groups, right? And it's it's an opportunity for folks to get involved across the organization. And you were the global lead of women of Meraki for several years. So I, I want you to tell us about that experience. You know, what did you learn? How did it shape you? You know, talk to us about that. I am so glad you asked this question because I'm so passionate about this topic. Um, And yes, I had the amazing, fortunate experience of serving as global co-lead for Women of Meraki alongside Helen Freem, who is absolutely incredible. And I'm, I'm so passionate about this because we are literally changing the world. And I want to say that again, this employee resource organization at Meraki, the Women of Meraki is changing the world. And I think we all have the opportunity to do that every day if we're really purposeful about it. But there is a gap, and it's a really visible gap in the technology industry at Cisco and at Meraki, where we are trying to close this gap um, of seeing more women be successful in the industry, in leadership, in our company. And this organization is designed to propagate this message and to help remove any barriers, to help make Meraki the best place to work in the industry, regardless of one's gender. And so I'm so passionate about it because, you know, this organization is not just for women, by the way, it's for everyone who's interested in learning about this cause and helping to to make this cause something that um, there's a solution for. So you know, the Women of Meraki allies is a huge part of what makes the Women of Meraki overall successful. And that's a group of people who are just learning about the situation, becoming more educated about the the hurdles that women face in technology and uh, at this company in general and helping to remove those roadblocks. So I had a really amazing time. You know, the Women of Meraki is a great organization that puts on all kinds of uh, tools and resources for for women and for Moroccans um, to continue to grow and develop their careers. Things like, you know, financial workshops, brand building workshops, to, to your earlier point, Sammy, you know, leadership development training, mentorship opportunities, fireside chats with amazing female leaders, just all kinds of resources available for primarily women to continue to grow, to develop and, and gain the skills and the confidence that they need to become world changers. So I did it for two years and it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. It was, you know, I called it my labor of love because it was in addition to my day job. Um, and with my my career change, it became a little bit difficult to balance all of that. So I passed the torch at the beginning of this fiscal year to Rachel Green, who's doing an amazing job as co-lead with Helen. Um, but it's something that I will continue to be involved in and continue to be passionate about because it is so important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the point you made too about male allies is super, super important. I think maybe sometimes men think, oh, women of Meraki or women of Cisco, I can't join, right? No, absolutely. We need our male allies. And that is so important, right? Because if things are going to change within our industry, we can't do it alone, right? Mm -hmm. We need that support. Absolutely. And I've been fortunate to have some really fantastic male mentors and male sponsors who have candidly helped get me where I am today. So I'm super grateful for every male ally out there. I just want to say shout out. Thank you. You're doing great things. <laughs> Love it. Um, so I, I want to talk to you a little bit about, and I ask a, a lot of our leaders that I interview on this podcast, this question, because I think it's, it's fascinating. And I like to get everyone's take on it, especially as women rise in their career. Talk to me about imposter syndrome. Um, does it happen to you still? Um, and if it does come up for you, what tools have you kind of employed to help get you through it? Or maybe what advice have you given men or women who come to you and are, you know, are saying, Hey, I'm experiencing this. Um, what does that look like for you? 
Oh man, this is such a weighty topic. Um, it's something that actually I was uh, on an interview panel this morning with a woman who was talking about this very same thing. And uh, imposter syndrome, to answer your first question, absolutely. I deal with imposter syndrome still. I have dealt with it in the past. And I've been surprised to learn that it's not only something that affects women. Men deal with the same thing, but <clears throat> especially changing roles. I think it's a, it's a really <laughs> unfortunate opportunity to experience imposter syndrome. You know, you work your tail off during a, a lengthy interview process to land this amazing dream job. And then you're thrown in and you're expected to do the job. And all of a sudden you start thinking, oh my gosh, who did I trick to get this job? I can't do this job. It's so hard. I'm not qualified. I won't do a great job. I'll fail. They'll figure me out. Um, but it's, I think it's something that we all deal with in one way or another. And it's, it's something we can all combat with, you know, a few different things. Number one, stepping back and seeing yourself for who you are, who they hired to do the role. You know, you, you convince someone that you could do the job by your past experience and by your presentation skills. So, you know, I think reflecting back on, what have I done to get myself to this point? Who am I? Who do I say that I am when I'm my most confident self? And really internalizing that and starting to let that sink deep down in you when those, those moments of doubt come in, because they inevitably will. Um, and then I think also this is where it really helps to have a strong mentor and, and a strong, you know, you hear sometimes about who would be on your, your professional board of directors if you had one. Who's in your corner? Who do you know that really knows you, really advocates for you? I think it's important to have those folks, you know, at the ready so that you can call and be really authentic to and, and it, you know, talk about it. Say, I'm having some doubts. I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed and underqualified. You know, talk to me about this. And people who know you and have confidence in you and, and can help reassure you when those challenges come in. And then the third thing, this is super easy, but it's something that someone I really respect told me when I started this role. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> yes. And I think there's a lot that goes into that. And I think a lot of us are doing that. You know, if, if you don't feel confident, you fake it. Put on some lip gloss, put on some great earrings, get in front of that WebEx and fake it till you make it because you might just surprise yourself with how much you can accomplish. Oh, I love that. You know, <laughs> whenever I'm nervous or I have a big presentation or a meeting or interviewing, whatever it is, I always tell myself this silly little mantra, but it's like, they put on their pants the same way we do, right? Yep. Like one foot in front of the other, you yep. know, they're just people. So that mantra of fake it till you make it and hearing you say that and hearing that come from, you know, really experienced leaders within our organization is so comforting because it really boils down to the fact that we're all in this together, right? And we're figuring out as we go. We don't know all the answers. Yes. Well, and you know what? That's one other thing that I think I'm still working on candidly with my executive coach is being comfortable, not having all the answers because guess what? Nobody does. <laughs> and yep. if we do, we're in the wrong job because it's time for us to grow and challenge ourselves with something new. So the, the last thing that I would add there is, is be, be confident in the fact that you don't have to have all the answers. It's okay to say, I don't know, but I'll go find out and come back to you. Right. In fact, employees appreciate it, right? Yeah. They don't want to hear a BS answer or something that's not real. Um, there's so much more respect for a leader who says, you know what? I don't know, but I have a great team and I have awesome resources and I will find out, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for calling that out. I think that's really important. Um, and I loved your comment about, you know, having that board of directors. I want to circle back to that quickly, right? Create that network, have those people in your back pocket who can build you up, who you trust, because we all experience those moments and going to people who we really respect and saying, Hey, talk me off a ledge here is such a game changer. So if you don't already have one, you know, figure out who those people are in your life and get one. Absolutely. And be transparent, you know, tell them I'm, if I were to have a board of directors, I want you on it. You advocate for me. I respect you. I think we believe in each other and, and I need you as part of my board. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't want to jump on that? Right. I would. Chrissy, are you I volunteering would? yourself? Yes, girl. I'm on your board. 
<laughs> I love it. Um, okay. So let's talk about this idea. And I think a lot of women particularly, but men can absolutely feel this way too. That idea of I'm growing and climbing the ladder of my career. I'm starting a family. I'm juggling a million and one things. Is it actually possible to have it all? Um, I know that you, you mentioned before you're a mother of a toddler. You just took on this new role. What are your thoughts about this idea of maybe sometimes feeling like you need to compromise in one area or the other, or do you think it's possible to do it all? Where's your head at? Yeah, I love this topic. I'm super passionate about it these days because as you mentioned, I do have a toddler. He's 15 months. I've got a dog. I've got a husband. Uh, I have this amazing job that I love and I'm extremely passionate about. Um, and you hear so much discussion about work-life balance. How do you achieve work-life balance? You know, what's the secret sauce there? And I've heard a lot of different people give me different advice, none of which I've loved. <laughs> and I recently um, came back from maternity leave about a year ago and was talking with another female engineering leader who was asking me how I was doing. And I was telling her, um, I'm doing great. I, I love it. I have this baby. You know, he's at home. I have a nanny. I love my job. I feel so fortunate. I never knew I could do all of this and manage it, do it well, and be really happy. I've always, you know, I, I had, I got married later. I had my first child later. And I don't think I ever really believed that I could manage it all. But when you set boundaries, when you keep your priorities in line, you really can have it all. And I don't think that it is some magic trick. I don't think there's any, you know, map to get you there. But I, I do think that if you have a priority of maintaining a really great personal life, um, my girlfriends, my family are all really important to me. My child is very important to me. I ha my husband's very important to me. But you also put your career as something that you won't compromise either. And you work for a great company like Cisco that provides you with amazing resources to manage all of those things and have a great life, you really can have it all. And I'm confident that you can do it. I'm doing it myself. I feel so blessed every single day because I work for this amazing company that supports me and my personal life. They understand I have one and it's important. Um, and, and you really can have it all. And I don't think it has to be this like constant struggle of work-life balance. I think it just kind of becomes something that all works together. Mm, that's really, that's really good advice. Yeah. To your point, I think everyone has such a different take on it. And I love how you just came out and said, you know what? I don't really like the advice I've been given from anyone. I'm going to set my own path and, and make it work for me. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I had people that I really respect say, if you want to focus on your family, your career's going to have to take a back seat for a while. And if you want to focus on your career, your personal life has to take a back seat for a while. BS. I don't believe it. <laughs> I just don't. And I right. think I'm proof that you don't have to make something take the back seat for a while uh, to have, you know, everything moving in the right direction at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I would say to your point, if, if someone is struggling with it, Cisco Meraki, you know, or find other additional resources at whatever company you're at, you know, there are coaches that can help you. Like you don't have to do it alone. I think that's exactly. the biggest thing too. If you're struggling, reach out and get those resources to help, you know, help you make it work because it yes. is, it is possible. And you know what? That's a great point too, Sammy. Lest I paint too rosy of a picture, I have bad days. Everybody does. <laughs> you know, yes. I, I definitely have, have my days. Um, but I have great resources. I have a great support system. And honestly, we all have the ability in us to focus on the positive. And it's really easy to focus on what's negative. And, and I just don't believe in that as, as a life strategy, I really believe in focusing on the positive, believing the best, and then that being the end result. Yes. Oh my gosh. Let's make a shirt that says that or something. I could preach <laughs> that all day. 
Um, yeah. it, it's so, it's a choice, right? Yeah. It, it, it is a total choice and being positive and trying to see the glass half full and is just an easier way, in my opinion, to operate, right? Yeah. Versus being negative. Like, come it's on. So One of my favorite sayings is whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. Yeah. Yes. So true. Wow. Keep it simple, right? Um, yes. Well, we're wrapping up. I have about two more questions for you. This has been such a fun conversation, Christy. I want to, you know, get back to channel and, and, and Disty and kind of ask you about long-term vision, right? You said you're about six months into this role. Um, you're starting to probably get your feet under you and finally get a scope of, of the role and maybe set some long-term goals. You know, what's your vision for Meraki for Cisco in terms of how we innovate and what's the path forward for collaboration and kind of your your plan to really expand this channel motion? This is a great question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, we have a really unique opportunity at Cisco Meraki today to be the transformation engine of Cisco, which has historically been a networking company and the best networking company out there. I don't mean to make light of it, but at Meraki, you know, we are a recurring revenue machine. We are an innovation machine. We are a cloud managed platform that's building new routes to market like video surveillance and IoT sensors and amazing, you know, game changing technologies that are transforming Cisco from the inside out from being just a networking company to networking plus physical security solutions, um, you know, real-time data and analytics monitoring so that companies can, you know, derive really incredible insights from this data and make proactive changes for their customers to provide them amazing experiences. And we're doing this through the power of our, our channel organization, through our channel partners, through our ecosystem partners, through our amazing distributors that help provide these products to our partners. And I love where I'm at today because Again, we are at the helm of a, a really big change within this amazing organization that, that we're driving here at Meraki. I firmly believe that. And our partners are the engine that is driving this machine forward. They are really the secret sauce, the crown jewel that's going to help us scale well beyond what we can do as a sales organization. So our partners are out there. They, they are the tip of the spear for us. They are helping us unlock new markets. They're helping us tell our story. They're building customized solutions for our customers that can help them differentiate from the other competitors in the market and really step up as, as the shining star amongst their peers because they are empowering themselves with these powerful technologies that our partners are positioning. So, you know, Meraki has been on this amazing growth trajectory for the last 10 years. And I can say this because I have been a seller at Meraki, but we have built our success on the backs of little obsessive, compulsive, control freak salespeople that want to handhold every deal across the finish line. Again, I've done it. I can say it. But we won't scale unless we allow ourselves to become a more partner-led organization. So, Really, what I'm working on is empowering our partners to take us to that next phase of growth, because what got us here will not keep us here. We've got to continue to push the boundaries, and our partners are going to do that for us. Yep. We didn't come this far to come this far, right? Ah, that's what Jen says. I know. I love it. I love that one. Yeah, I think, um, and we can all say, right, if you've been on the sales side of the organization too, there is nothing better than finding a partner in your region or where you sell that you have this amazing relationship with, amazing trust, and they go out and they cultivate opportunities and bring you business to propel oh, yeah. your sales motion. I mean, there is nothing like it, right? So how do we find more of those? Yes, absolutely. I will never... Stop being grateful for the $1 million opportunity that closed when I was a PSS with a partner for a customer I still have not met to this day. I'm not kidding. That's amazing. Wow. That is true partnership. Truly. Wow. We need, yeah, that talk about a hidden gem. Woo. Yeah. I love it. Yes. Well, Christy, this was such a fun conversation and I know our listeners are absolutely going to eat this up because you're just a hoot and a half and have such great <laughs> energy. 
Um, I wanted to ask you about some sort of call to action. So if there are folks out there who listen to the podcast today and are really feeling inspired to take the next step in their career or try to find that board of directors or want to promote their you know, personal brand or try to cultivate one, what advice do you have for them? How do they go about doing it? That's a great question. Um, if I have any advice for folks looking to advance their career, build their brand, find their board, you know, I'd start with spend some time thinking about what makes you unique? What makes you special? Who are you at your core? And what, who are you when you're happiest doing, you know, doing life and start, start doing more of it. Put yourself in a position, whether it's at work or in your personal life, to do more of what makes you feel happiest. Um, you know, find people that you trust and ask them what your strengths are. You know, be be humble, be brave. Ask them where you can improve. Lord knows I've got areas that I'm working on improving every single day. Take risks. You know, reach out to people you don't know but you admire. Ask them if you can get to know them and find out what they've done to make themselves successful. People love talking about themselves. And so you'll be surprised who will say yes and give you time if you just ask. Get out of your comfort zone. Join an employee resource group. Get to know folks who aren't just like you and find out you know, what challenges they face and, and find out how you can make an impact there. Um, and then I'd say you know, be open to things that aren't exactly in the direct path of what's next because you'd be surprised if you start considering things that are a little bit on the fringes of what you can do when you stretch yourself get out of your comfort zone and consider what you might not think is the next right step it might be your best step yes what stuck out to me uh well a lot of things basically everything you just said but i love the the lean in be brave and what makes you authentically you? Like, when do you light up? When are you the most happy? Go towards that, right? Yes. Like really do some soul searching. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Christy, this was so awesome. Thank you for making my day. Um, you were such a wonderful guest. Will you come back and talk to us again? Please, this has been the highlight of my week. <laughs> I love talking to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, another great episode of the Meraki Unbox podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, listen, tell all your friends, and we will be back in another two weeks with some great content. Take care, everyone. 